Today we look at The Power of the Daleks, a story in which the Daleks go to Tesco to try and buy some Duracell AA batteries to keep themselves going. Except, not quite, as this is in fact one of the most important stories in Doctor Who's history, where the show demonstrated conclusively and triumphantly that it had what it took to carry on essentially forever. The game changed here, however big the show had been during the Hartnell years, it still probably only had the lifespan you might expect from a show of this time, a good number of seasons but ultimately not the long runner it's become. This was the moment Doctor Who became able to run for another 23 continuous years, and still be part of the television and cultural landscape of Britain nearly 60 years later. Yes, I am of course referring... to the decision to change the font in the closing titles. I mean, look, the Hartnell era titles had this font, a nice and clear one, but the Troughton era has this one, more space age even, truly a sign the show would adapt and change. Would the original font have been acceptable into the 70s and 80s? I'd say not. Oh, and I suppose the lead actor did change as well. Yes, after three years of the doddery magic grandad, the change to Troughton's Doctor is a sudden, huge, and extremely bold step in making this new Doctor completely different. It's often said, but it doesn't make it any less true, that this was the moment the show demonstrated it had the potential to go on for a long time, and the potential to adapt and survive beyond what it had started out as. Things would never quite be the same again. But there'll be plenty of time to go over all of that. Let's not be around the bush. The Power of the Daleks is a fantastic story, one of the best Dalek stories and one of the best of the 60s. It's arguable that the Daleks themselves never again reached the heights of power and terror they did in this story, and this is almost certainly the point where the Daleks evolved into the form they continued on to the present day in. The experimenting was complete, the Daleks are set out here, intelligent, calculating, ruthless and unstoppable, and with the elements of the initial concepts that have the inherent belief in superiority that inform their every move. The Power of the Daleks is a famous double title. The main vulnerability of the Daleks throughout the story is their need for power, and a struggle for that power is a vital part of the plot, but it also portrays the more obvious thought. The Daleks in this story feel powerful, like a force of evil nobody can stop. I think for the Pepper Pots themselves, it's one of their most impressive outings, and the clever plot and interesting character dynamics that surround them only enhance it. First though, let's look at the circumstances surrounding this story and why they matter. A lot of change between the Daleks' master plan and this story. A drop in ratings over Season 3 had put the show's popularity in question, and indeed Season 4's opener, The Smugglers, was the least watched story of the whole show prior to the second half of the 1980s. The behind the scenes troubles continued with John Wiles, I learned how to pronounce his name since the master plan, that's not going to happen often, so savour it. Being sacked or resigned voluntarily, accounts vary, just two stories later because of his irreparably poor relationship with Hartnell. His, relation, his replacement, Innes Lloyd, was more diplomatic about things, but decided to move Hartnell out by gentler means. He was, though no less convinced, Hartnell was no longer up to it. The show was also suffering creatively from a lack of direction and vision. Some new things were being tried, such as the war machines, but ultimately the perpetuation of the now-tired historical format and the general mediocre nature of most else they were doing contributed to the feeling the show was as tired as its star was. At this stage, Hartnell himself was becoming aware he was no longer really up to it, and agreed to leave. I think it may be lost in the sands of history how momentous a decision it was to even carry on at this point. Shows just changing a lead actor was not common and certainly not something that ever led to predictions of good news for said programme. Once the decision to carry on was made, it, was no doubt have been it would no doubt have been tempting to replace Hartnell like for like for like, a Cushing type thing, or it wasn't a complete replacement, but he was very clearly playing a, similar, a very similar character. Pretty much the same deal as the, as the one everyone knew and loved. The fact that's not where it went was another momentous decision that almost certainly secured its longevity. The show was not only demonstrating it could renew its lead actor, but renew itself, be something new rather than more of the same. The characterisation of Troughton's Doctor took a lot of back and forth, much of it apparently involving the show's original creator, Sidney Newman, and only really settled in its final form thanks to Troughton doing a great deal of the heavy lifting himself. And as a result, we of course get the Cosmic Hobo. Things are still at an early stage in this story. The Doctor playing his recorder while Ben and Polly are trying to get some information out of him is a contrast compared to how freely he would bring Jamie into his plans later on. That general feeling of pointless mischief was quickly replaced by something a bit more subtle. And there are various quirks that ended up not being carried forward, the stovepipe hat for instance, but generally the clear foundations of the second Doctor are there. Intelligent and calculating, but obfuscating, and quick to use silliness as a means of carrying out said obfuscation but also moral and authoritative when necessary, and always held together by Troughton's performance. But more on that later. With a new Doctor in place, the question had to be how to introduce him. The obvious answer was the Daleks, they were probably more popular than the Doctor, and using the show's most recognisable element as a means of smoothing the transition was an obvious move. The audience might not recognise the new Doctor, but they would recognise the villains. The Daleks would reassure confused or sceptical viewers that this was still the same show, and allow them to get used to the new Doctor with that familiarity to fall back on. 
While the peak of Dalek Mania was in the past by now, the Daleks were still popular and could provide a ratings boost that would be very useful in light of how the season had started so low. Indeed, that worked. The story did see a boost, and, and then there was a consistent level of decent, but not spectacular, viewing figures that were maintained throughout the rest of Season 4 and Season 5. The Daleks brought them back, Trout and convinced them to stay. Terry Nation wasn't available to write the story, so former script editor David Whittaker took over the reins. However, another former script editor, Dennis Spooner, who had also written much to Dalek's master plan, was responsible for the final scripts by most accounts, because Troughton, probably because Troughton was cast through in the writing process and by necessity, the scripts would have to, would needed to be rewritten to accommodate his characterisation as it developed. The final script is probably a blend of Whittaker's ideas and overall plots and Spooner's characterisation. Apparently Whittaker wasn't actually too happy with how the scripts turned out under Spooner, which I guess is just really a case of not quite fitting his original vision. Apparently Nation didn't like it either, as rather bafflingly he felt the Daleks were too nice, which does make me wonder how much attention he was actually paying, but never mind. In any case, that's the genesis of the story, and we'll get to its actual contents momentarily. First though, two post broadcast things to discuss. Firstly, if this story was meant to safeguard Doctor Who's future, it succeeded. The ratings went up, Troughton was secure in a role, and the show survived the decade. Arguably this is one of the stories most responsible for the show still being with us in 2024, and his legacy is forever secure as a result. The story's importance in that regard shouldn't be forgotten, therefore. Secondly, and a bit less positively, this story is of course not held in the BBC archives. As I mentioned in the Master Plan review, Terry Nation was attempting to sell a Dalek spin-off to American TV networks, and as a result the Dalek stories were withdrawn from overseas sale during 1967. The story's first sale to Australia snuck through just before, but the story was hampered by not being sellable at the time when it would have been at its most appealing to other broadcasters. When this prohibition was lifted in 1968, several countries had simply skipped forward to the Highlanders and begun with the Troughton era as if there hadn't even been a change in the lead actor. Thus, there are only two other countries that bought the story, New Zealand in 1969 and Singapore a few years later in 1972. Things with Singapore is that even after they started airing Pertwees, they would still buy Hartnells and Troughtons to fill out the schedule, so they tended to be a late buyer for many black and white stories. Singapore was sent the set of prints used by New Zealand, meaning there were only ever two sets of prints sent out. The Australian set was returned to the BBC in 1975 and almost certainly promptly destroyed, while the fate of the New Zealand and Singapore set is unrecorded, but I wouldn't exactly put an enormous amount of money on still sitting in Singapore after all these years. The BBC's original negatives were junked in 1974. Therefore, when the junking ended in 1978, no episodes of the story were held by the BBC, and that's a situation that hasn't changed since. Of course, it should be noted that being widely sold was no guarantee of survival, see Marco Polo if you want proof of that, and most of seasons 3, 4 and 5 set fared very poorly, so it's not as if this story is some unique case. What we do have of those seasons are two season 3 stories for which the negatives were kept in bizarre circumstances, a few orphaned episodes here and there, and stories returned from overseas, like The War Machines, Two Men of Cybermen, The Enemy of the World. Mostly in bizarre circumstances. For instance, it's theorised that the reason Tomb survived in Hong Kong was because they accidentally sent it on without screening it, got the prints back, and we didn't send them on again because they didn't update their records. In some cases, like it was for Tomb, just the case of serendipity and luck, and in the case of Power of the Daleks, lack of it. When it comes to the story, we did a few things. The soundtrack, obviously. But also, unlike Master Plan, a full set of telesnaps that helps with the watchability of the reconstruction enormously. There are also 8mm clips filmed by an Australian pointing a camera at his TV, which, while concentrated in the first two episodes, do provide several clips from Troughton's first scene we otherwise wouldn't have at all, and various other assorted clips found in other programmes. The cliffhanger to episode 5, for instance, exists because it was in an episode of Blue Peter. Bits and pieces, but unfortunately no full episodes. Power was, of course, also the first completely missing story to be animated, initially in 2016 and then again in 2020 with better quality. It marked really the transition period of the animations and what they were meant to be. Before then you only had them closing up gaps in mostly complete stories, by being as faithful as possible to the original and releasing as part of the DVD range. Stories such as The Invasion, The Reign of Terror, The Ice Warriors, etc. Power represents the first in a new kind of animations, those that would be used the original soundtracks and stories to create entirely new experiences to be watched. I'm glad they've been successful and that more are still coming up, with the Celestial Toymaker being the most recent at the time of this video, and I do completely appreciate what they're trying to do in essentially reimagining these stories in order to make them more appealing to the wider audience that they need to be successful, and I salute them for that. They are, however, in my view, not that great in terms of experiencing the original production, simply because scenes are cut, liberties are taken, all in the names of making the animation a better experience for what it needs to be. Therefore, for all these full animations done from power onwards, I won't be using the animations, and indeed I didn't for this watch. Happily, all the DVDs for the animations come with an official reconstruction, which is done to a very high standard that even comes with the option to replace the on-screen explanatory text with narration from the older releases of the stories, in this case by Annika Wills, which I think is a far better way of doing it, and I'm glad there's an option in these cases. 
As I said before, having a full set of telesnaps does help, of course. Therefore, through a combination of having those full telesnaps and the duration, I found these reconstructions fairly easy to watch, and certainly was able to get into the story much easier than I did Master Plan. It should be pointed out in my view this is a much stronger story, and certainly one that works much better as a reconstruction, while there is much that is lost visually, mostly the battles in the last episodes, and of course nothing will ever place the subtleties of Troughton's performances that are so badly missed in the missing episodes. The story's strength is in its plot, character, political intrigue, and therefore the story and dialogue are all strong enough to be appreciated without the visuals, or at least to the point where the telesats feel like they can be enough of a compliment. It's no replacement for the original, of course, but then nobody has seen the original in five decades, so that's just how it is. So, with all that explained, let's look at the story itself. Now, of all missing stories, but particularly completely missing ones, discussing the production is difficult because we can't watch it, so it's really just guesswork of what we do have. The Power of the Daleks was directed by Christopher Barry, who you may remember he did very good work on the first Dalek story, and indeed became a Who's stalwart director, not directing his last story until 1979. Although that was the creature from the pit, so sometimes there's something to be said for bowing out early. In any case, obviously we don't know how well of a job he really did, but from the bits and pieces we have, I'm inclined to think this was, it, was a do, it was a good one. A few of the surviving clips show off some great work. We are not ready yet to teach these human beings the law of the Daleks! And from what we do have of the famous I am your servant scene, it seems like Barry really did a good job of getting the necessary dread and tension onto the screen. From what we can see, it builds up really well, and once the height of it is hit, Barry uses his actor's performances to further build up the tension. So overall, the direction is difficult to discuss with any great accuracy due to the whole story being set on fire thing, but from what we can gleam, it was up to Barry's usual high standards. Which makes it even more the pity it's gone, eh? As for the design and effects, the production design of the colony is quite good. I'm not sure it quite got across the necessary scale to make this feel like the huge colony it's clearly meant to be, but, you know, budget and all that, and it looks good for what it is. The sets themselves certainly have a sense of scope to them, particularly Lesserson's laboratory. It also helps contribute to the atmosphere of the piece by making it feel more enclosed and tight than you think it should, so overall I think it's a good job. Some of the more budget-conscious decisions visible in surviving footage have become a bit notorious, such as the cardboard cutout Daleks, and it's a bit silly, but again, budget, budget it's a thing, isn't it? So it's understandable. Finally, the music is used very effectively and adds a great deal of atmosphere to proceedings. This story, however, only gets half credit for that, as, a, as the music itself is lifted directly from the first Dalek story for budgetary reasons, but it is effective, even if not original. Anyway, the thing is with missing stories is that the lack of any real perspective on what's on the screen due to not being able to see it means that certain other elements become all the more important, and the script is probably the most important. As in the medium of audio, what this and other missing stories have inadvertently become, the words are in effect the most important element. What carries the story is the strength of its plot and characters and how that weaves into an overall tapestry, placing both the new Doctor and the Daleks at the centre of that. Those two elements are the driving force behind power and what make it the success it is. First though, we must examine the other elements of the story as they're also pretty key. For a start, the overall plot is strong throughout. Obviously it's a combination of many different elements, but the story is at its core for me, a look at renewal, change and survival. The themes that naturally come from the Doctor's change permeate their way through the story. The colony, for instance, is obviously in a state of flux and change, one in which its future is, is at stake and how it handles this. And indeed, and indeed the Daleks have a similar arc. But this plays into the plot in a very important way. By making sure that these ideas all link into each other, nothing feels separate or tacked on. Whenever we go from colony politics to the Dalek scheming to the Doctor's growth, it all feels naturally part of the same idea and story. Which does sound silly when I say it like that, as if that's some massive achievement, when really it should be the bare minimum. But let me try and show you what I mean. The chase felt extremely disjointed and lacking in coherence. We went from unconnected plot to unconnected plot, and even the main threads throughout don't feel like they complement each other. The thread of, Doctor, the, of the Doctor and his relationship with Ian and Barbara, for instance, just feels like it's been tacked onto a few scenes without feeling like an important one throughout. The Dalek's master plan is also guilty of this, albeit to a lesser extent. The initial storylines of politics and intrigue of the apparatus of the Earth establishment being used by Mavic Chen to serve the Daleks in its destruction, this all just disappears from the story halfway through and is not used to complement or link to any later material. The power of the Daleks avoids this and is the better as a result. Obviously some of the links are more clear than others, have a colony plot that drives the Dalek plot as the discovery of the latter is the instigation of the movements towards hostility in the former plot, but also how it links informatically, the Daleks' own renewal and that of the Doctors. All of the plots come together seamlessly to create one whole interconnected plot in my view, and that should be borne in mind when talking about it. Another way the story excels is through pacing. Too often with six passes, time would just be wasted as they plod along trying to fill out the runtime when four episodes would probably have been enough. For this story, there's no way in hell you could fit it into four episodes without losing so much about what makes it work, and that's because of how expertly paced it is. 
Everything develops at pretty much perfect pace. Episode 1 spends just enough time on establishing the basics in the new Doctor, while allowing enough to be left to grow and develop the rest of the story. The rest of it is used to set up the main plot, and it does a fantastic job of just in a few scenes to completely clue in the audience in what's happening. It's actually remarkable how quickly the first episode gets through things, even when giving over a good 10 minutes or so to the post-regeneration stuff. It really does a great job of setting things up. The Dalek reveal is also great, because the focus has been really well placed elsewhere throughout, the Daleks are not at the forefront of the mind, and so their reveal feels like a natural development, rather than something you're just waiting to turn up because their name was in the title. The rest of the story then slows down a bit, but this is a good, it's a good thing. It allows things to develop at a really well done natural place. To explain things in, to explain this in any great detail would basically just be to recount the plot, for which I don't see an enormous amount of point. And besides, you'll see what I mean when we look at the individual aspects, so um, I'll take my word for it. As the final point in this general overview, I'd like to quickly touch on the dialogue. Because it's really good, sharp and witty, and helps improve all the characters of how natural and yet in keeping with how they're all developing it feels. I wish to use this as my one opportunity in this video to bash New Who, because this is so far above kind of the level of dialogue you'd get from Stephen Moffat and others. It's just, I don't know, it feels like I need to point it out. It is really top quality in this story. So the first of the plots to look at in this story is that of the colony. Vulcan is an Earth colony in the year 2020, and yes, it's just a coincidence it has the same name as Spock's planet from Star Trek. It's a comment that's been done to left, let's just move on. It's clear as soon as we get into this plot that Vulcan is a, as a colony is not at all well. We quickly gather through well-placed dialogue and interactions that there is much political discontent, and the governance of, Vul of Vulcan is not exactly going well. At this point, however, it seems manageable. What makes this plot so effective is how throughout the story things slowly develop and, well, get worse for the colony, as new political allegiances are revealed and the authority of Governor Hensel dis dis dissolves. Again, showing well how the plots are linked is that it's the Daleks and their development that spur on this movement. As the episodes progress, we go from thinking things are mostly under control to learning how widespread the rebel movement is and how much power it holds. The slow build throughout the story, another chink in the colonies after after another, really helps build up the feeling of dread when it compared to the growing power of the Daleks, and indeed the final slaughter in episode 6 is just as much there to show how the final failure of the colony has resulted in its near destruction, just as much to show as the power and ruthlessness of the Daleks. Indeed, the whole idea of the Daleks as their servants is to show how deep the troubles of the colony lie, and how much the early part of the story before the cracks appeared was such a mirage, that it takes such an easy, untried and ill forced out solution to show how desperate they were. The real strength of this colony plot is in its characters. We get in the four or five major colony characters a cross-section of their society and a real image of the people who are at the heart of a decaying society like this one. Quinn is a straight man, so to speak. Clearly the least corrupt and most dedicated to actually trying to right the issues here, but still clearly a bit ineffective and lacking in cunning. How easily Bregan outsmarts him and framing him makes that clear enough. He nevertheless grows throughout the story, eventually with the Doctor's help rising to the point where he's confident and capable enough to take over at the end. It's not the most important part of all of them, but it's one that's necessary to show that the colony does have the people it needs, and does have the chance it needs. Governor Hensel, on the other hand, is having a fascinating caricature of the strong, effective leader, as despite what we're told by the other characters, intentionally ironically in the script for sure, he is completely fucking useless. He's all blust bluster and pomposity, and he can't actually achieve anything, and there's no doubt to the audience as to why the rebellion is growing and why the colony is essentially collapsing. He can't control Bregan, he can't control Lesserson, he sure as hell can't control the Daleks, there's not much he really can do. It's fascinating really that this is actually quite a timely portrayal in my eyes, as for a good 60 years we've had politics based on bluster and image rather than any actual ability. Again, here's a sign of how the story, that of essentially the failure of this colony, is being told for his characters, and Hensel is a character that demonstrates this failure. Bregan is another kettle of fish entirely. Bregan is almost the opposite of Hensel. While Hensel was bluster and pomposity, Bregan is cold and calculating. He is a sign of how ill the society has become in that his one goal is his own power, and he'll throw away anyone and anything in their colonies to get it. His villainy is built up slowly, again showing off the story's pacing and that we slowly build together his plan and his treachery. His story is also linked with the Doctor's. As despite how well Bregan has planned, we always see the Doctor as one step ahead, and it's only through brute force that Bregan is ever able to get the advantage on the Doctor. What makes him all the more effective though is how coldly effective he is about it. His motivations are one dimensional of course, he wants power, but the way he goes about it makes him still seem like, well, a believable bastard. By the time he has the Dalek kill Hensel, we've seen him grow to the point where it's telegraphed well in advance and simply add to the menace that we can see but Hensel was too blind to. In early episode 6 he also makes it clear the rebellion he has supported and planned is just as dispensable to him as well. I also like how unlike most of the other characters who die at the end, it's not the Daleks that finish him off. While he was just as blind about the Daleks as the rest of them, it wasn't his true flaw and what truly made him a villain. That was his willingness to use every aspect of the colony to empower himself and see its degeneration to serve that end. And therefore his death at the hands of Valmar, a less significant character I won't be covering for reasons of brevity, basically he was part of the rebellion and was won over by Quinn, 
is a perfect end for him, being shot down by one of the parts of the colony that he had very much taken for granted in his path to power. A winning performance by Bernard Archer, who would later play Marcus Scarman in Pyramids of Mars, another multifaceted villain, makes Bregan a superb baddie, enough that you almost forget the Daleks are actually the true enemies and not him. Among the rebels themselves, the most important character is Jan Lee. In her first scene, she's making it clear what she wants and how she wants to get it. She wants change and she wants rid of the government that exists at the moment. But her methods, violence, manipulation, blackmail, show the extremes to which she'll take that. It's an interesting look at how going to extreme lengths to achieve achieve change can be a double-edged sword. Yes, it can achieve the change, but it can lead one to to do unsavoury things, and it can blind one, such as using the Daleks as a tool without realising the threat. When victory seems so close, it leads one to take destructive risks. What also works about Janley, though, is that she thinks she's as manipulative as Bregan, but she's just clearly not. She can work around a political novice like Lesserson, for sure, but the other rebels don't trust her, and her embrace of the Daleks shows her judgement is poor. She's taken out of the hands of the Daleks, blind distrust of the system and blind trust of the Daleks leading her there. She's also a counterpoint to Lesserson. Her single-mindedness blinds her to the Daleks' intentions despite the growing evidence, while his scientific curiosity makes him all the more aware. Which does bring us on to what's probably the most important of the colony characters at Lesterson. The colony's chief scientist guy, he's the one who first discovers the Daleks. At first we get the impression he's just a generic mad scientist type who's going to go to extreme lengths for his work and that'll make him a villain who'll need to be stopped. A type that's a dime a dozen in Doctor Who. But quickly we see the layers to him. The Doctor quickly uncovers that he found the Daleks well before he let on, which shows a sign of subtle cunning that was not immediately apparent. He becomes all the more interesting as he's using that in service of the colony, which shows his side of how rotten the society has become, single-mindedness to achieve in his own field without thought or consequence. Again, on the surface, pretty generic and well-trodden, but it plays into the overall themes of the piece well in presenting the character. But that's not why the character stands out, it's how he evolves. Episode 2 ends with a famous I am your servant scene, which we'll look at in more detail in the Dalek section, but in terms of Lesserson, he's standing there triumphant. He's found the solution to the colony's problems. For him, it's certainly the peak moment in what he thinks is a great achievement. Episodes 3 and 4 are where it all changes. Throughout the episodes, he slowly but surely begins to realise what's happening here. He realises Jan Lee's manipulation and blackmail of him and begs the obvious question. If he could not see her treachery, what about the Daleks? As obviously we the audience know the answer to that, it's a question of him catching up, of his realisation of it. Our discovery here is not that the Daleks are the baddies, but rather that Lesterson's opinion of them is changing. Episode 3 ends with the Daleks chanting about how they will get their power, i.e. chanting they will get the control of the one power Lesserson still has over them, that they need the power to operate, and episode 4 opens with his realisation that he needs to use that power. But all that does of course is clue the Daleks in that they need to watch him and find a way to overcome that. It's all superbly done, the slow realisation of his mistake and how it affects him in his judgement. Despite his mistake in reactivating them, this realisation and the ability to see it certainly puts him a cut above most of the rest of the colony, which keep ploughing on with their crap plans involving the Daleks until the bitter end. Episode 4 ends with Lesserson entering the Dalek ship to find him reproducing, which finally confirms how badly he's fucked us up and how badly he's failed to fix his fuck up. Naturally, with death on a huge scale certain and it being more or less his fault, his choo-choo goes right round the bend and he goes mad. Or does he? See, in his final scene, he crawls out of a hiding place to confront the Daleks. I want to help you. Why? I am your servant. We do not need humans now. Ah, but you wouldn't kill me. I gave you life. Yes, you gave us life. The final ramblings of a madman? Or maybe not. See, that gives the Doctor the distraction he needs to sort out the power thingy Bill Bob and destroy the Daleks. Perhaps Lesterson is not as mad as he seemed. Instead, using an opportunity to atone for a mistake, even if it costs him his life. Lesterson is one of the true successes of the story, a character that we see develop and change over the course of it. His story is one we follow closely and understand every twist and turn. Paced perfectly and played wonderfully by Robert James, this is one of the finest supporting characters of 62, and possibly even the story of the series as a whole. With the supporting characters out of the way, let's look at the regulars. Ben and Polly aren't too important in this one, and that's fine, it isn't their story and doesn't really need to be. Their important role in it is essentially to be the audience identification point for the new Doctor. It's their questions and their concerns that drive the first ten minutes as the new Doctor finds his feet. The natural questions the audience wants to know are asked by them, and that does work really well. This thread continues throughout the early part of the story, as Ben and Polly try to get a grip on the new Doctor at the same pace the audience does, And indeed, the moment where Ben becomes convinced the Doctor is the Doctor is when the Dalek recognises him at the end of episode 2, again being the audience proxy they need to be in that scenario. 
After that, they sort of drop in importance to the point where they can each get an episode off so the actors can go on holiday. But again, that's fine. It's not really their story and they do the job they need to. And Annika Wills and Michael Craze do a fine job with it. Which does bring us to the new Doctor. An overall look at the second Doctor is a discussion for another time, which means I'll be looking, limiting my look at him to his introduction in this story and how that played out. One, of course, must not underrate how important this change was. This wasn't just a normal regeneration as we know it now. This was a fundamental change to the idea of Doctor Who. Hartnell's Doctor as its central character had been the only consistent element throughout its first three years and has been, for many, the linchpin of what the show was. To bring in a new actor playing the role completely differently was a bold, bold risk and one that could easily have backfired. Therefore, Troughton's introduction needs to be played very carefully. The first thing they did right with this was giving him the first ten minutes or so of episode one just to deal with the aftermath of the change at the end of the Tenth Planet. It again seems, seems run of the mill now when post-regeneration scenes have been growing to become entire post-regeneration stories, but I think it's deeply underrated how important this scene was. As mentioned, Ben and Polly provide the audience viewpoint, asking the questions that the audience are no doubt asking, but the scene strikes a perfect balance between keeping the audience up to date with what's happening and reassure that this is still the same show despite the change, but nevertheless retaining the mystery to avoid it, just becoming over-explained exposition. Hints are given, it being part of the TARDIS and giving its name of Renewal, both of which end up not being in the long-term canon, but oh well, it's enough to get the audience clued up on what's probably happened, but with enough blanks to fill in themselves. It also plays with it a bit, having the change in what the Doctor sees in the mirror makes it clear enough to the audience that this is really the Doctor no matter what, and going through artefacts from past stories, which was incidentally also how James Bond dealt with the change of a lead actor three years later in Alan Manchester's Secret Service, so influential Doctor Who strikes again. Anyway, it shows again that this is the same person and the same show. But the Doctor's strange behaviour and referring to himself in the third person again leaves a bit of mystery and confusion, enough that we want to follow the new Doctor in learning more about him. While the idea of whether he's truly the Doctor is wrapped up by the end of episode 2, as previously mentioned, his growth throughout the story establishes this new Doctor's character. As I said at the start, it's not quite how the second Doctor would truly end up, and I think part of that in order for that to truly happen, he needs Jamie to bounce off, which he obviously doesn't have here, but it's still impressive in how it's laid out. We quickly gather as the Doctor takes the identity of the Examiner, but this Doctor is quick thinking and smart on his feet. He's also intelligent to the point where he's clearly well ahead of all the humans in terms of thinking. Again, he easily outsmarts Bregan, it's only Bregan's physical force as the security chief who can summon guards that temporarily wins him the day. But the Doctor's far more subtle about it. The first Doctor was always happy to show off that he was the smartest person in the room, the second would rather let that be hidden in order to take control more subtly, and those early episodes of this story are crucial in setting that up. Indeed, the obfuscating intelligence through a bit of mischief and silliness become a key part of the Doctor's characterisation, and you can see how early it's set up here. A bit I especially like is when he and Quinn are in prison and he's using a water drug to try and hit a note to open a door, and Quinn's frustration has become all too apparent. I love how the Doctor simply ignores it and doesn't let Quinn's frustration overcome his attempts, and eventually he's able to use it to get Quinn out and therefore win his trust. It shows that he's also willing to play the fool in order to be just as powerful as the first Doctor could be. He also demonstrates an ability to read people which also shows how quick shows quickly how intelligent he is and plays into the obfuscation angle. I also like that this clearly has its limits though. While at no point does this facade drop for any of the human characters, when it comes to the Daleks he makes no attempt to hide how he truly feels. The end of episode 2 will again will be dis discussed later, but the real fear in his voice when the Dalek is unveiled is one of the few times the mask slips in this story and the real second Doctor, moral and concerned, horrified at the idea of the death the Daleks may cause, comes out. It perfectly shows us our new Doctor, intelligent and coming, happy to hide and subtly blend in, but also as sharp and aware of the real threats as ever. He's not like the first Doctor at all, but, and we get that, but the same traits that made the Doctor such a popular hero are also still there. He's the same, but different, and I think it is really balanced perfectly. Troughton is of course magnif magnificent, if I haven't said it before I'll say it now, that I think he was probably the best actor to have ever played the part, and it's such a shame so many of his performances lost, because the subtleties we, he managed were always so sublime. Obviously this is one of the stories we, that are missing, so we just have to go on his vocal performance, but it's excellent as always, and really gets across everything we need to know about him. Overall, the introduction of the new Doctor is really well handled. There was everything to lose, and they avoided every trap and made it a success. The growing throughout the story of all the different traits that prove both the similarities and the differences for Hartnell's Doctor showed the series was in safe hands. Clearly the audience agreed as the difficulties of the previous year were gone, and the show survived until the end of the decade in this format. The power of the Daleks unquestionably achieves its most important and difficult task. Which brings us to our Pepper Pot friends, indeed the reason we're here. I think it's arguable that the Daleks had never been again as threatening and menacing as they are in this story. They seem terrifying and powerful, a threat that feels just as deadly as the Doctor makes them out to be. And it's funny really that this isn't over the conquest of reality or anything like that, it's one Dalek ship and its attempt to conquer one Earth colony. 
And yet the Daleks seem like an unstoppable force of nature in this story. In a way, as I said, I'm not really sure they've ever been again. Much of that comes down to the way the story is structured, as I'll now explain. The story's near-perfect pacing is clearest when it comes to the presentation of the Daleks. We don't see them until the end of episode 1 where they are dormant, their familiar forms being a reminder to the audience of their danger, but at that moment only a theoretical threat. It's throughout the story from this point on that their menace continually grows. It starts with Lesserson's testing when one accidentally, or perhaps not accidentally, opens fire on and kills one of his assistants, Janley's hiding of which is part of her blackmail of him. Again, the story weaving in and out of all its separate plot plots brilliantly. Anyway, I like how it's left up to the audience to decide whether the Dalek killing the assistant was just a dormant reaction, or perhaps a subtle attempt to do Dalek stuff. In any case, this comes to a head at the end of episode 2, with probably the story's most famous scene. Lesserson has reactivated a Dalek which is shown off to the Doctor's horror, and this is the point where we learn the Daleks are not only powerful and murderous, and driven to conquest, they're also intelligent and manipulative. We quickly realise even though these Daleks aren't bursting out and killing everyone, they're just as dangerous and the Doctor's panic only reinforces that. They're not ready yet, but just like the Doctor, they've read this colony and know what they have to do to get in a position to take over. And all just from four words. I am your servant. This is honestly one of the best Dalek scenes in the whole history of the show. I can't praise this enough and it's a fantastic end of the episode. This continues throughout the story. The Daleks slowly gain in power as the situation of the colony deteriorates around them. They gain the confidence of most of the humans even as they lose essence, and it's just incredible to see their manipulations at work. The cold intelligence does occasionally let slip though, a Dalek has to correct itself from saying it's better than humans to merely being different, which is obviously a means of informing the audience more directly of their true intentions, but also an interesting reminder of the most important tenement of Dalek life that Ian revealed to us all the way back in the first Dalek story, a dislike for the unlike. As these elements to drive the story for them, a cold, ruthless intelligence to manipulate and gain time and power, but also their intentions are only hidden by that desire to manipulate, and even then just barely. It gives the contrast it needs to give, the Dalek's facade versus their true identity, and again, tying into the rest of the story, it's a parallel with the Doctor, both for hiding their true intelligence behind obfuscation, and indeed with the colony, its problems being hidden behind, the, uh, behind this facade. Their power naturally goes throughout the story, getting closer and closer to what they need at small intervals. They get their weapons, the Doctor and Co realise there are more of them and they're growing, stuff like that. The dread and the menace just grows throughout the story. Before they reach their height, their height though, one of the most important and talked about scenes of this story. Bregan orders the Dalek to kill Hensel, and after the deed is done, that Dalek asks him. Why do human beings kill human beings? I can't impress on you enough how good that line is. It's just an op oh so open to interpretation in a brilliant way. It ties into the dislike for the unlike thing, a disbelief that humans consider themselves important enough to kill themselves over power. Or perhaps disapproval on that basis. After all, at this point in the series, the Daleks never turned on each other. Indeed, that plays into the themes of the decaying society and around them, and how human has turned against human in a game of manipulation and power that has already led to deaths and will no doubt lead to more. It's led to the point where the Daleks think they are better than us. And perhaps in that way they are right. Or perhaps the line is curiosity. Why do human beings kill other human beings? Is there a reason we Daleks can learn from? All of that plays into how the Daleks are presented in the story, and all of that just from one line. It's an absolute genius line, but wouldn't have the impact it does if the Daleks hadn't been effective as they have been throughout. Ultimately though, the Daleks are at their most powerful and menacing in the story, I think, because, well, that's how they're portrayed. As they're failing to do maths or being pathetically pushed around by a bunch of fowls or getting taunted by the Doctor for not being able to climb up after him. There's nothing like that, nothing that makes the Daleks seem in any way pathetic or weak. They feel menacing and dangerous when they're growing in power and manipulating, and when they finally unleash on the colonists, they feel like an unstoppable force of nature. A great scene is when Jan Lee proudly orders a Dalek to fire on the opponents of her rebellion, and it does. Only issue is that it then also fires on, her fires on her rebel friends as well. In her desperation to stop it, it simply turns around and says, your usefulness is over, and within minutes she's dead at the Dalek's hands. Another great one is a simple and short one, but it's simply the haunting funeral chords theme from the first Dalek story playing over shots of the dead bodies. The Daleks just tear through the colonists in episode 6, and they feel truly unstoppable doing it. Important though is how they're actually stopped, and the story does that by having the angle of their power, their need for electricity to power themselves as their one weakness against humans, being played up throughout the story. It's the one power Lesserson has over them, and he uses it alright, but all that does is convince them to find a workaround. But it's obviously only a temporary one, and that thread, the valid titular power of the Daleks, gives them a clear weakness and one they seem to be able to overcome partially. It therefore feels like a natural end to them as they get blown up by the Doctor fiddling with their power, and certainly one that doesn't diminish the power and menace they had early on. Too often the Daleks can feel just as powerful, but then get knackered by a silly deus ex machina that just makes them look pathetic all over again when they get destroyed by it. Not the case here. 
The way their weakness is naturally built up means it becomes a perfect ending for them. In some ways they were just as superior as they thought, but their one weakness was their undoing. Combined with some phenomenal voice work from Peter Hawkins, this is my pick for the Daleks that they're most impressive. Their story is perfectly paced for Al, growing in menace and stature, and always doing so with the contrast of the humans they so easily manipulate and the Doctor they see as their truest threat. While the Daleks certainly had their moments of power and threat on many other occasions, I think the combination here of smart storytelling and a genuinely impressive threat has never been surpassed. The power of the Daleks' most important element was the introduction of the new Doctor. But the show's most popular element, proving their staying power, was in my view just as important in this story, safeguarding the show's future. The power of the Daleks is to me a triumph. Smartly plotted and well written, with great characters, fantastic enemies in the Daleks, and making one of the most important introductions in the show's history effortlessly. That is missing is one of the great tragedies of 60s Who, as honestly I think it's one of my favourite stories of the decades, and certainly one of my favourite Dalek stories. Whatever I might think of the animation, and I'm not a huge fan, for reasons people who made it could do nothing about, I should clarify, budget related mostly, even if you ignore that it doesn't really represent the original production, I can't tell you how glad I am it was animated in order to order to open it up to far more people. That someone today can, go, today can go on to BBC iPlayer and watch The Power of the Daleks, even as a low budget flash animation, it's something I'm pleased with. The BBC made a fantastic story and then threw it away, but at least we get it back in one form, the circle of life. Or something, I don't know, I've definitely run out of things to talk about now, so... Um... This story gets a final score from me of 9 out of 10. Brilliantly performed, smartly written, the Daleks at their best, and safeguarding the future of the show with the introduction of its new star. What more could you ask for? Honestly, a really top quality story, and one that I hope I've convinced you all by singing the praises of. Honestly, I'd say it's maybe the best use of the Daleks themselves has ever been. Fantastically done, and well, it's just a shame the most important thing holding the story back is something that's nothing to do with the people who put all their all into making it, but rather short sightedness and an itchy trigger finger on the flamethrower. Oh well, even as we have it now, this is still a story that's very much worth your while.